Thank you, Ari, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Welcome. Uh, it's fantastic to see so many distinguished friends from around the world here today. Um, Twenty years ago, a private collector walked into my office in London and presented me with a few small photographs. And he said, how, how would you date these paintings? And I had a quick look and said, well, off the top of my head, they look to be circa early 15th century. He said, okay. He said, I'm gonna leave the photographs with you and I'll be back in six months and we'll discuss it again then. So I propped the photographs up on my desk and I would see them every day. And in between the other projects that I was working on, every once in a while I'd pick one up and I'd, I'd have a good look. Gradually my eye became accustomed to the subtleties in the paintings. And I realized that no, they weren't early 15th century, they were earlier and somehow they were different in a way that I couldn't quite explain. So I became quite intrigued and I embarked on a, what ended up being a, a many a research project that, that unfolded over many years. So the lecture that, you're, that we're having today is a distillation of that research journey. Okay. Towards the middle of the 13th century, Chinese imperial court painting resembled that scene in the Four Sages of Mount Shang, a work by renowned artist Ma Yuan. It was probably painted at the court of Southern Song Emperor Li Zong in Linan, Hangzhou province, around 1225. The Four Sages are mythic figures who are said to have disagreed with the actions of a Han Dynasty emperor in order to preserve their moral integrity, they withdrew to Mount Shang, where they pursued the arts of self-cultivation, thereby exemplifying Confucian and Taoist ideals. The painting's aesthetic and its technique, masterful brushstrokes and subtle washes of color on paper, epitomized the prevailing canons of Southern Song painting. Within 70 years, the Chinese imperial court art also looked like the image shown here. The painted stone sculpture depicts the Tibetan Buddhist protector god, Mahakala, in his guise as Gurgi Gompo. The image is rendered in what Himalayan specialists will recognize to be a Nepalese or Newar style. This startling new imperial court style reflects the enormous social and political changes brought about by Mongol rule in China. Between 1260 and 1368, patronage of Tibetan Buddhism and its arts were one of the largest expenditures of the Yuan state, amounting to several tons of gold and silver, hundreds of thousands of bolts of silk. The small initiation paintings that are the subject of this lecture are, I will argue, rare surviving examples of a Himalayan inspired school of art that flourished at the Chinese Yuan court. The style combines Tibetan Buddhist iconography and circa mid 13th century Nepalese painting traditions with elements of style, notably textile and costume design that are demonstrably Chinese Yuan. Known in Tibet as Sakali, these paintings are recognizable by their small size. These measure about 17 by 16 cm. Their size facilitated their use in private ceremonies in which a Buddhist teacher initiated a disciple into particular teachings and more generally in any ritual setting that required small painted images of the Buddhist pantheon. Although this set of paintings is no longer complete, it is clear from the iconography of the surviving works that it served as an introduction to the 51 deity uh, by Sajiguru Mandala, a drawing of which appears on the left. Often described as the medicine or healing Buddha, Baisajaguru and his entourage 
are more generally associated with protection from harm, the assurance of long life, the accumulation of good karma, wealth, and an auspicious rebirth. At the center of the mandala drawing is by Sajaguru, surrounded by three circles of deities and four guardians of the cardinal points. The first innermost circle consists of seven Buddhas, one of whom is on the right, and the goddess of wisdom, Prajna Paramita. The second circle consists of 16 bodhisattvas. That shown on the left is Vajrasattva, in this context associated with the eastern cardinal point. On the right is Chandra Prabha, whose identifying symbol, the crescent moon, appears on top of a Tibetan-style manuscript that rests on the lotus on his right shoulder. Both figures are enclosed within golden trilobate arches, the background a rich red enlivened by fine scrollwork. The third circle of deities includes 12 Jambalas, wealth deities, one seen on the left, and the 10 world gods, ancient Indian Hindu deities who are incorporated into the Buddhist pantheon. On the right is the world god known in this context as Rakshasa. At the Mandala gates are four guardian kings, represented on the left by Virupaksha, guardian of the west, and the king of the Nagas. On the right is Dhritarashtra, guardian of the east. Important evidence as to the date and provenance of these paintings is to be found in Newar style Tibetan painting of the 13th century, an example of which appears here. This painting depicts the Indian yogi Virupa, who gestures towards the sun as he is offered a cup of alcohol by a divine mar barmaid. Now in the Kronos collections in New York, it was painted by a Newar artist, probably for Sakya Monastery in central Tibet, sometime during the second quarter of the 13th century. An inscription on the back of the painting states that it was consecrated by Sakya Pandita, who died in 1251, the charismatic leader of the Sakya order when it was the hub of 13th century Tibetan political and religious life. Sakya Pandita was also an unwitting accomplice in the creation of these Sakli paintings. In 1244, Sakya Pantita was summoned from Sakya Monastery to the camp of Godan Khan near Kokonor in the Qinghai region. Godan's armies had conquered large portions of Central Asia and were threatening Tibet's borders. His army had already made several punishing raids into Tibet and Godan was looking for a Tibetan with whom he could negotiate a Tibetan surrender. His advisors recommended Sakya Pandita, the same man chosen for the task by Tibetan leaders themselves. Sakya Pandita took two nephews, the elder a 10-year-old known by the epithet Pakpa, exceptional. They arrived at the Mongol encampment in 1247. Soon after his arrival, Sakya Pandita cured Godan of what was thought to be a fatal illness thereby winning his respect and gratitude. The Sakya leader was able to secure relative freedom for Tibet in exchange for political cooperation, the endorsement of Tibetan's hierarchy, and the promise of generous tribute. In a letter written to his Tibetan colleagues from the Mongol encampment, Sakya Pandita explained the situation. The prince Godan has told me that if we Tibetans help the Mongols in matters of religion, they in turn will support us in temporal matters. In this way, we will be able to spread our religion far and wide. If I stay longer, I am certain I can spread the faith of the Buddha beyond Tibet and thus help my country. The prince has allowed me to preach my religion without fear and has offered me all that I need. He tells me that it is in his hands to do good for Tibet and that it is in mine to do good for him. He has placed his full confidence in me. I have been preaching constantly to his descendants and ministers. Now I am getting old and will not live much longer. 
Have no fear on this account, for I have taught everything I know to my nephew, Pakpa. Pakpa was instrumental in the creation of a Sino-Himalayan school of art at the Yuan court. After Sakya Pandita died in 1251, Kublai Khan formed an alliance with Pakpa along the lines of that enjoyed by their ancestors Godan and Sakya Pandita, a priest-patron relationship known in Tibet as Yun Chu. Pakpa is said to have insisted that Kublai assume a lower seat when he received religious teachings from him. When discussing political matters, Pakpa and Kublai were said to have been seated at equivalent levels. We will return to their alliance later in this talk, but suffice it to say that they served each other's aspirations. Pakpa provided Kublai with a Buddhist worldview which legitimized and sanctified his rule, and Kublai endowed Pakpa with tremendous wealth and power by which to spread the Buddhist faith. At the height of his power, Kublai ruled vast portions of Asia, effectively controlling two-thirds of the known world. The Mongol Empire encompassed the territory stretching from Korea to western Russia in the north and from Vietnam to Syria in the south. Within half a century, they had overwhelmed the Jin and Song dynasties in China, as well as huge stretches of central and western Asia and North Africa. In 1260, Kublai de declared himself the Great Khan. A few months later, he appointed Pakpa national preceptor Guaxi and asked Pakpa to perform his enthronement ceremony. Pakpa needed artists to, perform, to create the objects necessary for the many Tibetan Buddhist rituals that became an essential part of the activities at the Yuan court. When Kublai asked Pakpa to create a memorial stupa for Sakya Pandita, Pakpa went to Sakya in central Tibet to gather the best artists he could find. He also requested artists from the Nepalese king. Eighty, said to have included Indians, were sent, led by the supremely talented 17-year-old Nepalese artist known as Anige. The main root of the Sakali style lies in circa mid-13th century Nepalese painting produced for Tibetan patrons, a key example of which can be seen here. This painting is in the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, was produced for Sakya patrons by a Nepalese artist around the mid-13th century, about the time that Anige and his atelier were working for Pakpa at Sakya Monastery. This painting and another in the same set are extremely similar to the Sakali paintings in technique, composition, artistic vocabulary, line, and palette. I will bring your attention to just a few of the many compelling comparisons. The upper throne in the Los Angeles painting includes two golden makras, one on either side of the arch, their wide open jaws spitting gems, and an elegant tail uh, an elegant spray rising from behind their tails. Within this spray emerges a green snake that makes one loop on either side before forming a canopy for two deities who flank Garuda, half man, half bird, at the summit. One sees much the same configuration, although simplified, in the Sakali paintings. In the upper throne of the Amitabha Sakali, one sees the same makara snake configuration and the pattern of the makara's golden spray is virtually identical with that in the Los Angeles painting, as is the loop of the snake. In place of the Garuda bird at the top of the throne, in this Sakali, the artist renders a similar figure known as a Chepu Kirtimuka, in which only the head and upper hands appear, perhaps a concession to the Sakali's smaller format. The throne base in the Los Angeles painting includes a number of subtle details that also appear in the Sakali. Close examination reveals that the base in this drawing, 
the structure under here. So I'm talking about this part here. So the structure under the lotus is meant to exist in three spatial planes. A central projection, known in Sanskrit as a bhadra, flanked by two receding planes. Tiny colored lotus petals denote three distinct spatial planes. Blue lotus petal marks the central projection closest to the viewer, pink petals mark the adjacent receding plane, and green lotus petals distinguish that receding furthest from the viewer. One finds precisely the same configuration in the Sakali, although simplified, once again, almost certainly a concession to their small size. Thus, in the Amitabha Sakali here below is a golden gem-encrusted two-tiered throne base with a central projection marked by tiny to um, lotus petals in blue for the central projection and red for the adjacent receding plane. Inset gems seen in the throne base of a Los Angeles painting are here suggested by a variety of raised gold semicircular and rectangular shapes that likewise suggest inset gems. In both paintings, a similar throne cloth falls over the central projection. Further evidence that the main root of the Sakali style lies in mid-13th century Newar Tibetan painting can be seen in a comparison of a standing attendant in one of the Sakalis with that in a painting of Amitabha Buddha now in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. This painting is from the same set as the Los Angeles painting produced for the Sakya order by a Nepalese artist around the mid-13th century. Again, allowing for differences in scale, the attendant figure in the Sakali is about 9 cm high, half the size of the Boston painting attendant. There are remarkable structural similarities. The golden crowns with five leaves, gold uh, leaves inset with colored gems, rest along the forehead, secured with fluttering cloth ties. A gem a single gem-encrusted gold bauble surmounts the figure's tall chignons. A large strand of beads falls to the navel. The bracelets, upper armlets are all quite similar in design and execution. The upper armlets consist of gold ropes highlighted by a gold medallion inset with kelp-colored gems. Locks of hair, necklaces, and earrings are also similarly rendered. The figure's physiognomy and body type are also very similar, reflecting the Nepalese people's small frames and delicate features. The palms of the hands are covered with red henna to the fingertips, and the fingers are held in delicate, rounded gestures. Note the structure of a flower in another of the Sakali paintings, extremely close in design and execution to that held by an attendant in the Boston Amitabha painting. Like the Boston and Los Angeles paintings made by Newar artists for Tibetan patrons, the Sakali are painted in glue distemper, on cloth, using ground mineral pigments, which remains the traditional technique of Himalayan painting to this day. In Sakli paintings where there is pigment loss, one sometimes sees Tibetan letters serving as color cues to the artist. This detail shows the Tibetan letter Ja in the underdrawing. The purpose of such color notations were to remind the artist of all the areas in a painting requiring a particular color. Preparing the right admixture of pigments was a laborious process with idiosyncratic results so color notation would eliminate the need to remix a color later, perhaps an inexact match to the original pigment. All the Sakali are bordered in red pigment with a yellow inner highlight, a border highlighted by a thin gold line here on the left, just as one sees in the Los Angeles and Boston paintings, a detail on the right. Thus, the technique composition, artistic vocabulary, palette and line that one sees in the Los Angeles and Boston paintings produced by Newar artists for Sakya patrons are so close to one, what one sees in the Sakali that one is led to conclude that whoever made the Sakali 
had a fundamental knowledge of circa mid-13th century Newar Tibetan art. And yet, despite the many parallels between the Sakali and these 13th century Newar Tibetan paintings, there are important differences, and these differences as well provide critical evidence as to the date and provenance of these works. In the mid-13th century Nepalese paintings made for Sakya patrons seen here on the left, the textiles are Nepalese, as are the garments into which they are made. Amitabha, the main figure in the Boston painting on the right, wears a tight-fitting lower garment that reveals the shape of the body beneath. He is bare-chested. Standing attendants are also bare-chested their lower garment dressed in a patterned diaphanous Nepalese cloth further adorned with scarves slung low on the hips, their ends arranged in neat flutters. In the Sakali representing Amitayas, essentially the same deity as that in the Boston painting here on the right, one sees something very different. The body is cloaked. A wide green scarf covers the shoulders and upper arms, and the torso is draped in a blue cloth cinched at mid-waist by a white sash. The lower body is also covered with thick layers of presumably silk cloth. A blue cloth with gold pattern covers the thighs, itself layered in a pink garment bearing a green gold decorated border. The cloth depicted in the Sakali and the manner in which they are rendered is not Nepalese, but Chinese. Before further examining this visual clue, let us briefly return to Pakpa and Anige at Sakya Monastery in 1261. Following a successful construction of a memorial for Sakya Pandita at Sakya Monastery in central Tibet, Pakpa insisted that Anige accompany him to the Yuan court. Pakpa needed artists to create works of art and ritual objects for the many Buddhist ceremony ceremonies to be conducted at court. In late 1262, Anige arrived at Dadu, Beijing, and was introduced to Kublai Khan. Chinese and Tibetan histories report that the emperor was favorably impressed with a talented, handsome artist and presented him with an artistic challenge. A southern sung, bronze of an intricate Chinese acupuncture model, had been damaged and was judged to be irreparable by leading court artists. Could Anige repair it? To the immense pleasure of Kublai and to the astonishment of the court artists, he did so, completing the repairs in 1265. Anige had won Kublai's conference, confidence. In 1269, he became the chief supervisor of the artisans of the Grand Capital, responsible for overseeing all imperial commissions in painting, sculpture, architecture, and textiles. Anige took orders directly from Empress Chabi and from Kublai. Thousands of artists, said to include Tibetan, Nepalese, and Chinese, worked under his direction. He trained Chinese artists in the making of Himalayan-style sculpture. He also had the opportunity to learn Chinese painting and sculpture from the many commissions on which he worked with Chinese artists. Anige studied Chinese language, became proficient in the art of Chinese calligraphy, and is said to have collected Chinese paintings. He was lavishly compensated for his work, given vast properties, gold, silver, and silk. He married a Song Dynasty princess, and his residence was that seized from the Song Dynasty heir apparent. Few examples of the Sino-Himalayan style developed by Anike and his atelier survive. In introducing Chinese art under the Mongols in their groundbreaking book of 1968, Sherman Lee and Wai Kam Ho noted the far-reaching influence of the Nepalese style introduced by Anige and his atelier, but they were unable to describe it in detail because so few examples remain. 
More recently, Aning Jing has published a wealth of information about Mongol patronage drawn mostly from Chinese historical sources. In, 12, in tw uh, 2010, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York mounted an important exhibition of Yuan period Chinese art, focusing primarily on Chinese traditional arts. Within the surviving corpus of Yuan period Sino-Himalayan objects is a woodblock frontispiece of the Chinese Buddhist canon printed in 1301 and seen here. The frontispiece presents the enthroned figures of Shakyamuni Buddha and a Tibetan monk flanked by four standing attendants. The physiognomy of the figures is essentially Nepalese and the throne structure, especially the upper throne backs and the throne base, is essentially that seen in the Sakali. Also of interest is a gilt copper alloy sculpture of Manju Shri, now in the Palace Museum in Beijing, dated 1305, here on the left. Like many figures in the Sakali, Manju Shri wears a large hoop earrings decorated with lotus petals, as well as strands of beads, short and long, enhanced with large colored gems. The crowns are also similar, consisting of a five-leaf diadem, each leaf embedded with a large inset gem. Rock carvings at Felai Feng in Hangzhou, constructed during the Song and Yuan periods, provide further evidence of Yuan period artistic parallels for the Sakali. Here we see a comparison of the designs of an inset central gem enclosed by lotus petals, surrounded by additional inset gems, that on Felai Feng on the left and in the Sakli on the right. Stone carvings at the Zhuyongguan Cloud Gate platform northwest of Beijing also provide relevant comparisons between the Sakli and the Yuan period works of art. Constructed under Emperor Togun Timur, it was planned and overseen by the last state preceptor at the Yuan court, the Tibetan Kunga Gyaltsen Pal Zangpo, between 12, 1343 and 1345. In many of its iconographic details, the guardian of the east at Zhu Yongguan resembles a guardian in another of the Sakli paintings. Both figures play a lute-like instrument decorated on the body with dragons and clouds. The guardian's multi-layered costumes and chainmail armor are also similarly rendered. On the left is a Yuan silk textile depicting the Bodhisattva Manju Shri, now in the National Palace Museum, Taiwan. From lotus petals to silk scarves and crowns, the parallels with the Amitaya Sakali are noteworthy. In both works, deities' legs are covered in thick folds of fabric indicated by heavy shading, and the scarves drape over the lotus petals in a very similar manner. An attendant figure in the Amitaya Sakali can be compared with a wooden sculpture of the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, dated 1282 and now in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Note the wooden figure's lower garment, which resembles that's w that worn by uh, Amitaya's standing attendants, and indeed by most standing attendants in the Sakali, consists of two layers of cloth, the uppermost significantly shorter than that below. This shows a Yuan period wooden sculpture in the Nelson Atkin Gallery. Note the movement and the flourishes in the handling of cloth, the knot, the knot in the upper scarf and the flowing curves along the bottom of the skirt. All find parallels in the Aimetaius Sakli on the right. Not only are there clear parallels between the Sakali and the Yuan period works with regard to costume design and the handling of fabric, but the textiles depicted in the Sakali are Chinese textiles of the Yuan period or earlier when identifiable. The meandering tendrils pattern on the border of many of the fabrics in the Sakali can be found on the border of an inscription dated 1282 to 92 at Felai Feng, the Buddhist cave site in Hangzhou, just noted. 
The textile in another sakli depicts a jeron or a Central Asian antelope, also seen in a textile fragment in the Cleveland Museum of Art, identified by James Watt and Anne Wardwell is of the Jin period, which ended in 1234. The Cleveland Jin fragment shows the animal against a floral motif with the moon above. Watt and Wardwell note that this antelope also appears in Jin and Yuan art against a cloud as it is seen in the Sakli depicted here on the left. Several of the textiles in the Sakli depict a soaring phoenix in gold. This too appears in surviving Jin period textiles such as the example on a blue ground now in the Cleveland Museum of Art. The Sakli paintings are mounted with cloth, cloth borders, a customary Tibetan treatment of Sakli meant to be hung during ritual ceremonies. These fabrics also link the Sakli to the Yuan period. Chinese textile expert Zhao Feng of the China National Silk Museum in Hangzhou examined the Sakli textile mounts and agreed that when identifiable, they are Yuan period or earlier. On the left, the meandering phoenix and peony flowers on a pale salmon silk ground, a common motif of the Yuan period. This textile is used as a mount for the majority of the Sakli. It has been carbon dated to the early Yuan with a 95% confidence uh, between 1271 to 1300. The geometric pattern brocade on the right, used as a mount for some of the Sakli, is structurally consistent with other Yuan period lampus fabrics. Another important feature in the Sakli painting style, and one that differs from its Nepalese antecedents, but which does reflect Chinese artistic norms, is a reticence to reveal the human body, in particular the female body. The detail on the left is from the Sakli depicting Prajna Paramita, the Buddhist goddess of wisdom. On the right is a detail from a circa mid-13th century painting of Tara, the Buddhist goddess of compassion, which was produced for Tibetan patrons. It, in this great icon of Himalayan art, one finds a consummate expression of Himalayan attitudes to feminine divinity, evident in the sensuality of the bare-breasted, compassionate goddess. In contrast, Prajna Paramita's shoulders and upper arms are covered, and in the portion of the torso that is uncloaked, no breasts are delineated. All the other female deities in the Sakali, including a green goddess seen here, observe similar Chinese norms. The same concern to cloak the body has already been observed with respect to the Sakli's Buddha figures. Amitayas contrasts with the prevailing norms of Himalayan painting as seen in the set of mid-13th century Newar paintings uh, for Sakya patrons. In the Los Angeles and Boston paintings, one sees a naked torso adorned with jewelry. Not so in the Sakali. Shoulders, upper arms, torsos, and legs are covered by rich Chinese fabrics. In short, although most of the features in the Sakali suggest that the artist was well acquainted with mid-13th century Nepalese art, one also sees important elements reflecting Chinese Yuan period artistic norms. Iconography in the Sakali provide further evidence of ties to the Yuan court. The Buddha paintings in the first circle of the Sakali Manda include a spiritual lineage illustrating Sakya teachers recognizable by their distinctive red peaked caps and their Indian Buddhist predece predecessors. Although none of these figures can be identified with certainty, it is possible to postulate the identities of two other historical figures, each the subject of a Sakli painting. One is a youthful looking Sakya monk in the teaching gesture, flanked by Sakya monks richly attired in robes adorned in patterns of gold seen here on the left. This is the only Sakya monk whose portrait is the subject of a Sakli painting and in this respect he is given equal status 
to the historical figure represented on the right. The male figure in this painting wears boots and a red underrobe adorned with a golden wheel, a chakra, cinched, cinched at the waist with a golden sash. A gold adorned short sleeve blue outer robe covers the shoulders and falls the length of the body. This garb closely resembles that worn by two Mongol rulers depicted as donors in a Yuan period Yamanteca Mandala Kosu, now in the Metropolitan Museum here on the, on the, on the right. The two male donors are identified by inscription as Tog Timur, the great great grandson of Kublai, who ruled China from, 12, from 1328 to 1332, and his elder brother, Koshila, who reigned briefly in 1329. Koshila, on the right, wears a costume similar in design to that of the historical figure in the Sakali. It too consists of a red underrobe with a short blue-sleeved outer robe that covers the shoulders and falls the length of the body. It is reasonable, therefore, to infer that the portrait represents a Mongol ruler. But other iconographic elements shed further light on his identity. He holds the stems of two lotuses bearing a sword and a book the attributes of Manjushri, indicating the artist intended to associate the Mongol ruler with the Buddhist deity of wisdom. The artist is likely to have had one historical figure in mind, and that is Kublai Khan. Historians agree that Kublai Khan was known as an incarnation of the Bodhisattva Manjushri. The only other Mongol ruler accorded this honor was Altan Khan, the 16th century protagonist in the second conversion of Mongolia to Buddhism. There is some debate as to whether Kublai Khan was known in his lifetime as a, an incarnation of Manjushri or whether this accolade was merely a later attribution. Recent research, however, has shown that at least two 13th to 14th century Tibetan sources discuss Kublai as an incarnation of Manjushri. In the biography of Urgyenpo Rinchen Pell, Urgyenpo remarks that Kublai was known as an incarnation of Manjushri, and he questions the veracity of this claim. The second source is a slightly later 14th century biography, uh, in which Kublai Khan is described as a wondrous manifestation of Manjushri. But the artist describes yet another accolade to Kublai Khan in this portrait. The Mongol ruler wears a red cloth turban surmounted by the head of Amitabha Buddha. This feature, a cloth turban surmounted by the head of Amitabha, appears in only one other context in Tibetan art when it signifies Song Sengampo, who died in 649, the first historical ruler of Tibet, a great champion of Buddhism and its arts, and perhaps the most celebrated political figure in Tibetan history. Song Sengampu appears in a sculpture in the Potala in Lhasa, wearing a cloth turban surmounted by the head of Amitabha, here on the right. This unique iconographic composite in which Kublai Khan appears as the incarnation of Manjushri while also bearing the attributes of Tibet's greatest religious king suggests the high esteem in which the great Khan was held by the patrons of the Sakali. It is interesting to note that according to the official Sakya history of this period, Pakpa and Kublai discussed Song Sengampo during their first meeting in 1253 or 1254. Kublai Khan was warming to Pakpa, whose well-reasoned responses were a refreshing change from the so-called inept Tibetan lamas he had seen previously. Pakpa's intelligence, his strength of character, his learning, and his fine diplomatic skills were, are apparent in the dialogue attributed to them in this official history. When asked by Kublai Khan to name the great Tibetan political figures of the past, Pakpa cites Song Sengampo and two of his successors. When asked why Song Sengampo was so great, Pakpa responded that he was an incarnation of Avalokiteshvara, 
Soon after, Pakpa informs Kublai Khan that Song Zengampo had also conquered China and had subsequently taken control of two-thirds of the known world. The parallels with Kublai Khan are clear. As was noted earlier, Pakpa and Kublai served each other's aspirations. Pakpa provided Kublai with a Buddhist worldview that legitimized and sanctified his rule, and Kublai provided Pakpa with tremendous wealth and power by which to spread the Buddhist faith. While a Yuan period attribution for the Sakli can be confidently argued, it is less certain whether a more precise attribution of provenance and chronology can be made. The presence of Chinese stylistic attributes in the Sakli make a Chinese provenance more likely than that of Tibet proper. Uh, by Sajiguru or medicine uh, Buddha rituals for which the Sakli were made, may well have been conducted by Pakba and others in the large community of Tibetan monks who were integral to the Yuan court. We know that at least one of Kublai's personal physicians was a Tibetan. The Yuan court was the epicenter of the Yuan power where Kublai Khan and Pakba lived and where Anige's atelier was based. Because of the enormous patronage afforded Tibetan Buddhism and its arts, in some years amounting to nearly half of the national budget, Yuan scholar Aning Jing described the Yuan capital Dadu as the greatest center of Tibetan Buddhist art in its day. In 1275, Anigo was in charge of at least 3,000 artisan households. A few years later, he uh, commanded at least another 10,000 artisan families. Jin states that among the professional court artists in Anige's atelier in the capital, roughly half were Nepalese and Tibetan and half were Chinese. The presence of Kublai Khan in the Sakli, and presumably Pakpa as well, also point to a Yuan court attribution. Of their complementary roles, Pakpa wrote, secular and spiritual liberation are something that all human beings try to achieve. Both depend on a dual order, the order of religion and the order of the state. The order of the religion is presided over by the Lama and the state by the king. The heads of religion and state are equal, though with different functions. Further articulating this worldview, the Yuan scholar Herbert Frank wrote, the Lama corresponds to the Buddha and the ruler to the Chakravartin. In the 13th century, these figures were Pakpa and Kublai. Aning Jing confirms the imperial preceptor, Pakpa was the most prestigious figure under the emperor. Were the Sakali commissioned during the reign of Kublai and produced in the extensive atelier of Anige? Time does not allow a thorough analysis, but I will mention briefly some evidence relevant to this further discussion. They appear to be earlier than the circa 1303 murals at Shalu, created by Yuan court artists, brought to Shalu to renovate the sections of the temple. They also appear to be earlier than these two, um, the, the uh, textile on the left and the monument on the right. The uh, Zhongguan Gate Buddha, uh, Buddhas are more sinified in facial features and body type, quite different from the Himalayan physiognomy in the Sakali. Their thrones differ significantly. The Buddha images at Zhongyong Gate uh, are very closely foreshadowing Yunglo period sculpture that is from 1403 to 24, which, uh, with which they share many elements of style. A comparison of the figure of Dhaturasta in the Sakali and that in the 1427 to 42 murals at Gyantse Kumbum in Tibet reveal continuities in iconography and style, but within a very different artistic grammar. Finally, this 
figure in an Arhat painting in the Jokong, brought to my attention recently by a colleague, clearly has relevance to the Sakli, but the date of this painting is itself open to interpretation and, in my opinion, is likely to be of the Yuan period. With the collapse of the deeply unpopular Mongol regime, most Tibetan monuments in China fell victim to anti-Mongol sentiment. Consequently, all, only a small fraction of the Sino-Himalayan works produced at the Yuan courts survive. I have argued that these Sakli are among them, as difficult as this is to establish, given the paucity of the artistic record. Nevertheless, there is sufficient visual and literary evidence to make a strong case that this, these beautiful paintings were created under Yuan imperial patronage by an international atelier trained by the Nepalese artist Anike. Thank you very much for your attention.